Hello again. Making a video right now in response to this video by Mark Sargent, where he interviews uh, a man named Ray, who says he's a retired USDA surveyor. And um, he called Mark to just let him know that after watching uh, one of his documentaries, he had to just call in and let him know that, uh, you know, he knows better and uh, needed to, it's almost sound like a confession, really, you know, to just let him know that he knows, he knows what's right and uh, the earth is flat. And they have a pretty long discussion. I listened to quite a bit of it, not all of it. Um, it's, it's a lot like the other video that Mark has a so-called surveyor on there. And I, you know, People who call themselves surveyors, you know, I'm wondering, is he licensed? Has he really uh, been through all of the training and education required to be a licensed land surveyor? Uh, every state has their own requirements for that. So I didn't, I'm not getting into that into this, in this video, but uh, basically I, you know, I listened to the first interview, some of it, a lot of it, and then this one. And I have questions on really what, how much do they actually know? And I'd use an analogy like this, um, and this isn't to disparage anybody of, of what their occupation is, but you know, you have different levels of <clears throat> of understanding. If you're a carpenter, you know, you're if you're a beginning carpenter, maybe you're called a journeyman or an apprentice. You know, you're not the guy teaching you, are you? You're you're the person learning. So everybody is at a certain level with how much they know. Also, let's, let's also consider the fact that people um, will work in a, in a job that may never really touch on all of the aspects. Um, you know, if you're a guy who only puts in flooring, um, you know, and you do that for 10 or 20 years, you're, you're very, very good at putting in floors, but you may never ever touch a window or a door. And you may not have that knowledge or ability to install the door. If you're uh, working in a kitchen, uh, you know, you might be the chef and you understand all of the requirements to make the entire meal. But if, if you're, if you're a line cook, you know, you're, you may for years and years, you may only deal with the fryer and you're just dealing with the one aspect of the recipe. And so you don't have the full uh, uh, view of, of all that, that, that there is involved in it. So, um, you know, so bringing it back to this, um, the conversation really surrounds a lot of talk about leveling, doing level work uh, regarding uh, the study of the behavior of water and, and for flood control and, and these types of things. Uh, and he has no experience doing any type of geodetic work so what I'm going to do in this video is show you where the geodetic aspect fits into what Ray was doing, even though Ray didn't know it, it's part of what he did. Um, and so let me, let me start getting into this. I, I, I want to try to keep this short. Uh, short videos seem to do better. You get the, get the uh, word across, even though this one's nearly two hours long that I'm reviewing. Uh, and, and at this point here, 59 minutes in, just about the hour mark, just shy of an hour in, I get honorable mention. Mark uh, mentions the very first video I put out there. Uh, long, seems like a long time ago now, but um, it was my first stab jumping into this arena saying, I mean, I literally thought, oh, pff, all, all this flat earth stuff here, uh, here, you know, geodetic surveying to the rescue. Obviously, if I, if I just show them geodetic surveying, you know, this will all be, be cleared up. And, you know, I was naive. Let me, let me tell you, I, I really, <laughs> I didn't know really who I'm dealing with, what I'm dealing with, and the extent that this goes to. So, so that video was packed, jammed with a lot of information that really should be teased out and made into separate videos. And I've started doing that a little bit. Um, you know, just trying to focus on one item at a time. You could say that this particular video right now that I'm making 
it's probably going to focus more on leveling than anything else. But uh, but I will I'll, I'll you know start to show you that in a minute here. Uh, but I will talk about the comment. I was surprised that this was the thing that that Mark you know um, took note of this, uh, this topic of the the Statue of Liberty. So I made a comment here over on his channel. Um, you know that I'm really when you look at that part of my video, I have a screenshot coming out of this particular Flat Earth video called Flat Earth Proof 3 Land Ho. I mean, that's the video that makes the claim that you can see the Statue of Liberty from 60 miles away. And it's really supposed to be hidden by, you know, I forget how much curvature it said. And, and I say, you know, so what? I mean, like, there's a lot of places in the world that you can see really, really far. And the point to that is, well, so, so you can see, you can. Um, that, you know, I don't see what the big deal is about that, uh, except that what the Flat Earth videos are doing is they're tagging along with that is that, hey, you're not supposed to be able to see that far. And he, the reason is, is that these objects should be hidden by this amount of curvature that they calculate. So anyway, I went ahead and made a video literally just focused on this video only. And I, and I left the link here to it. And, and I just put that up a couple days ago. Um, and, you know, that reminds me also of that video called, that John McIntyre did called uh, Mountain of Evidence, or Flat Earth Mountain of Evidence. I also made a video reviewing that, uh, basically saying the same thing. I mean, uh, just because you can see something, it doesn't, I mean, you can see it. And then that's the point. I mean, you can see it. So, you know, and that's why I'm saying, so what? I mean, if, if I have to explain why I would, you know, exclaim, so what? It's because I can't understand why everybody's making such a big deal about that you could go up on a mountain and see another mountain and, and then say, well, really, you shouldn't be able to. Why? Well, because I've calculated this in some way, and that's really supposed to be hidden. Um, really? Come on. I mean, come on, you know. So anyway, in that video, and, and maybe in this one too, I don't know, I go into the details of using the curvature formula. And I, I'm making a point that it's really being misapplied. It, the curvature formula isn't meant to compute hidden or missing curvature. That's not what it does. You have to establish the horizontal plane from which that amount gets measured down from to the curve. Anyway, let me move on here. Um, so, yeah. okay, I'm done with this, so I'll just close that. So I have some things I want to show you. Um, in in the uh, in the discussion um, that Mark is having with Ray, it came up. He talks a lot about sea level. You know, he's talking about sea level a lot, and that kind of clued me in that Ray, you know, worked in a government job as a USDA surveyor, if, if that's what they called him. But he's, used, he's, he's using layman terms. I mean, we don't talk about leveling in reference to sea level. That's how we would describe it to someone else who isn't familiar with surveying. But as a surveyor, we level in reference to a vertical datum. And the current vertical datum is uh, NAVD 88, the North American vertical datum of 1988. I'm going to show you some of that here. But here's a map just showing the state of Missouri, because this is where, you know, Ray worked, and uh, he may be totally unaware that there is such a map showing the triangulation through the state, the first order leveling, and the second order leveling. And uh, in terms of order, what we're talking about here is, um, I heard Ray make the comment that his work had to close within one-tenth of a foot. And Mark said, yeah, what's that about? Just over an inch, right? Yeah. Well, you know, that's like topographic uh, order work. That's better. That's lower than third order. Here I'm showing you the, uh, uh, the geodetic leveling manual. And uh, you can download this book. It's, it's going to show you, I mean, how arduous and time-consuming and rigorous this uh, – type of uh, leveling is to perform. It isn't easy. Let me just fly down here a little bit. 
uh, you know, it talks about station spacing, how, how close the marks have to be, uh, that fact that you level uh, backward and forward through these marks, you know, you double level through these. Uh, you know, there's reconnaissance, mark setting. There's a lot to it. And uh, you can grab that book, take a look. I think this is important because these videos keep popping up talking about surveyors. And uh, let me close this. I'm done making my point with that book. Done with this map. Um, <clears throat> I'll get to this map in just a minute. Let's look at, let's look at, oh, here again, Missouri. Let me zoom out a little bit. This is the leveling diagram for, for the state of Missouri. And again, it's showing first order and second order. The first order, of course, is much harder to do. The closure requirement is very, very small, uh, you know, um, and uh, then here's the dash lines are second order. So once the first order leveling routes are established through the state, then you come off of those. And, and pretty much at every one of these junction points, will you'll find one of these disks that uh, Ray talked about set in concrete to last a really long time. He, he did talk about that. That's, that's very true. So every state has a diagram like this to show you, you know, uh, what's involved. And then what I want to show you is the, the whole country it looks like this. Uh, it's an old map. It's just showing the leveling that was done through the whole country, through every state. It's a huge amount of work. And I mean, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of these disks set in concrete. And I'm going to show you one of those a little bit later. So before uh, the current datum, NAVD 88, which I'm going to give you a reference to, you can look it up. That datum before that was called NGVD 29. That's the National Geodetic Vertical Datum of 1929. And that one was somewhat related to sea level in this way. There were 13 tide stations along the seacoast on the Atlantic side and on the Pacific side. And those tide stations are the ones that were held fixed in the entire adjustment of that datum. And, uh, you know, I might be getting into more detail than is necessary. Uh, I would have to be on a two hour interview to go into all those details. So uh, I'll just leave it here. So, you know, here we go. You see all the leveling that occurred. Uh, and uh, many of these marks are still out there and still available to use as benchmarks in reference to these datums, vertical datums. Uh, the next thing I want to show you is, well, this map here, which is um, just the map. That it's, this is called a geodetic control diagram. And it, uh, I, I, by the way, I made a video just on this topic alone. You can go and look at that. But this one here is for is one of the ones in Missouri, and I, I picked the one where Ray lives now, which is uh, near um, uh, St. Louis. And this is an interesting map because it shows all of the geodetic work that was done, not just the leveling. Like here's a first order level route. Okay. It also shows distances. These dark lines are electromagnetic uh, distances that were measured using EDM. Uh, and, uh, and of course, all these triangles are triangulation. And I have videos on my channel describing what triangulation is. And I've gone into some details about that. And uh, so here's, here's a lot of the control over here where Ray lives. And I'll close that one and get to this part, which is I've, I've made a video about this too, just searching on geodetic control. And I just went here to St. Louis. And I did a, a control search here, just a six mile radius. And you can see all these disks that are available and they're broken out as vertical marks. So a lot of these do not have horizontal positions on them. They are just strictly leveling. And the way they're plotted is just by map scaling, just saying, hey, it's right about here. But that doesn't mean anybody ever 
went there and located it with a, a, a theodolite. Now these ones that are horizontal marks are, they have horizontal uh, positions on them because they were triangulated or GPSed or, uh, or some other uh, means to locate them. So let's see if we find some of these you can bring up and a lot of times they'll have a picture of the disk itself. Let's give it a try. Let's see if we find one. That one. See here, a lot of times they're not found because they were destroyed by construction. Yeah, so it's always good to do a little planning before you go out there. Let's try to find something that has a disk. Kind of doing this on the fly. So here's a photograph. Nice. So usually what they'll do is they'll show you a photograph of the station near to some building, and then of course a close-up of the disc itself. Oh, look at that one. Cool. It's a neat disc. It's not your normal standard uh, survey disc. <laughs> so that has uh, some commemorative. It's pretty cool. I know nothing about that disc. So hey, anyway, that's there for anybody that wants to look into it. You know, uh, so that's that. And moving along, so back to Google Earth. I think I'm done making the point here. Again, I do have a whole video just on this topic. I'll just close that. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about was some examples of where geodetic surveying comes into play uh, and, and why someone like Ray or the other surveyor that uh, Mark interviewed doesn't really know about it because he that's not what he's doing. But um, there are people who do this. Now, these are old maps. Um, here's an example of what it takes to put in control, control points to build a bridge across a, a large waterway. You'd see all the triangulation that they did and they would, uh, you know, compute latitude and longitudes on these points from all of this triangulation. Well, that isn't gonna help anybody build the bridge directly. Uh, that is necessary to design the bridge, to account for the curvature of the earth across this great, this huge lake and build that bridge correctly, get all the piers correct, everything. But they're, when those construction plans are uh, designed, they are not gonna be with latitudes and longitudes. They're gonna be computed in state plane coordinates. And I'm gonna show you what that is too. Those are planar coordinates. They're northing and eastings or you know, X and Y values that you can just do normal trigonometry uh, calculations with, that you do not need to be doing ellipsoidal calculations. So there's, so there's a role to be played with the geodesy that takes place for the overall area, and then it gets broken down and designed on planar coordinates. Right? So that's that one. Here's another one just of a city. Uh, where the ge geodesy is done across the country and every urban area has some of these marks. And then those marks, those latitudes and longitudes are projected onto a state plane coordinate system for that area. Um, actually, let me show you that. Is that a control diagram? Oh, here it is. I couldn't find it. State plane zone codes. Here, here's a cool map. So here's the, the country broken up into the different state plane zones. And um, let's go to Missouri. I'll zoom in a little bit. That froze up on me. So Missouri has three state plane zones. So basically, because of the Earth's curvature across the state, 
they need to kind of break it up into three zones that basically overlap too. So like if you're working in this county right along the zone, you could work in either projection. Now, so you would just decide which one you want to stay in. And that way, all of your state plane coordinates are, um, you know, basically that's that, that's it. They're state plane coordinates. They are northing, easting values. Um, I guess I should show you what that is. So that you don't have to work with ellipsoidal values. And that's why I think a lot of these surveyors that they're coming out with all this flat earth business are talking this way is because they've never uh, dealt with these things themselves. Someone else is doing the calculations. You know, the work that they're doing is, uh, the work that they're doing, you know, was computed by others and, and they're doing their job, which is fine. But, uh, you know, let's not leap to the conclusion that, oh, the Earth's flat because the surveyor never calculates curvature. Uh, you know, well, it's like that line cook uh, working over there at the fryer. He never deals with, um, you know, any of the herbs and spices that are being applied in one of the other, um, you know, one of the other stages along the line. So, you know, it doesn't mean that you don't use herbs and spices in that recipe. Um so here's a here's a data sheet on some survey marker, and it's got latitude and longitude. It's got its vertical references here. Here's NAVD 88. You can click on that and find out what it is that we actually level, our leveling is uh, in reference to. But down here, you will see that those latitude and longitudes are uh, projected onto a mapping surface. This is the state plain coordinate Missouri east zone. And the, here's the values in meters, northing and easting. It's also projected on the UTM system, zone 15. And here are those values for northing and easting in meters. And uh, that's it. You know, uh, again, you can, you can look into this stuff yourself, and uh, hopefully you will. So I wanted you to see that as well. Okay, let's see. All right, so that's that's a city, and I have another map. I'm going to show you one last map. Here's a highway. So a highway is a very, you know, it's a linear feature, and back in the old days, they would triangulate. We don't do that anymore. Why? Because we use GPS. We use GNSS. We're using satellites to do this work now, and... Uh, but back in the day, they would do triangulation to set the control along the route. And that was the geodetic surveyor's job to do that part. And then the construction surveyor used these control points. And he would have a whole roll of plans talking about where to stake out the center line of the road, the edges, the, the, all of the topography needed to drain the road properly get the right pitch and all these things. That was all part of that. And it was all done in state plane coordinates. Okay. So that's how the earth's curvature is being dealt with at that local small area. Okay. So I made that point. I'll try to move through this a little quicker. So um, I wanted to come up with a, an example of a survey map in state plane coordinates. And I, and I typed in Missouri survey map state plane coordinates. And I thought I'd find like a PDF file of a map I could show you. But what I came across was this cool little book called the Missouri Department of Agriculture. It's the Missouri Coordinate System of 1983, a manual for land surveyors. And, and you go in here and you look through it. And look at the first topics the basic rectangular plane coordinate concept. It's chapter two, the curved earth. Chapter three, representation of a curved surface on a plane, on a flat plane. When they're using the transverse Mercator projection uh, for their three zones, then they go into the details of the Missouri coordinate system of 1983. And of course, you know, now we're gonna get into all the calculations. So I'm not gonna 
do that, but I figured this would be helpful to include in my video responding to Mark, who has now interviewed his second surveyor, trying to make the point that the Earth is flat. And it's not, people. It's just not. Here's your ellipsoid right there. Um, mine, just the other day I went out and did another lake uh, test. About 7,000 feet across the lake. And I've got the observations, and I'm gonna, that'll be my next video. Uh, it was going to be the video I was making today until I saw Mark's. And I thought, oh, let me, let me uh, address this a little bit. People, I hope this is helpful. Um, I'm kind of winging this video. It's not very well prepared, but you can see, you know, there's plenty of information. If, uh, if people are really interested, you can go and research the history of geodesy and find out the, the role it plays in, in your everyday lives. Basically, it's, it's invisible to you because you haven't seen that being done. It's a very niche thing. It's a very uh, specialized operation. And, uh, you know, it goes on kind of in the background. But the fact is, is that everything you see around you wouldn't be there unless some geodesy had been done to map those areas, whether it's a harbor, whether it's roadways, uh, you know, you name it. Uh, all of these things had to be surveyed. Um, mapped, um, like I did show John McIntyre. There he is using all these topographic maps for his investigation. And but where did all that come from? Well, that's why I made the video I did to show that all of that information came from somewhere. All of these elevations of these mountains, all the locations of those mountains, all happened because of surveying. In fact, it was geodetic triangulation and leveling up and through those mountain ranges, setting all of those disks. And uh, that's that's how we have what we have today, all the maps that we have, et cetera. Okay, so again, I'm just kind of winging this, so I think I'll just end it here. Um, I am gonna make a video about this topic here, about how the distances are uh, on the grid are shorter than the distances on the ellipsoid. And of course, at, up on the terrain. So uh, that's a video in the works. I'm going to say so long here, folks. I hope this is helpful. You know, just share it uh, with anybody you think is uh, interested in hearing more about this. All right. Thanks a lot. Talk to you. Bye bye. Lights basically consist of a series of mutually perpendicular axes. The vertical axis, which passes through the center of the horizontal circle, the trunnion axis, which passes through the center of the vertical circle, and the line of collimation, or line of sight, which passes along the center of the telescope through the center of the crosshairs on the diaphragm. Before it can be used to measure angles, the theodolite must be carefully centered and leveled so that its vertical axis passes vertically through the station, its horizontal circle lies in a horizontal plane, and its vertical circle lies in a vertical plane.